Okay, so our next speaker, very happy to introduce David Dilger. David is a partner with Paige Seeger Lawyers, specialising in employment and safety, and we're lucky enough to have him here today to share a legal perspective uh, on mental health in the workplace. David Dilger. Uh, thanks very much, everyone, and welcome. Uh, look, the good news is if you were expecting someone to come along, yes, I am a lawyer, but to give you a legal presentation, I am a lawyer who concentrates on non-legal solutions, and the better news is you're not being charged for today at all. So <laughs> let's, let's start with a story. And just bear with me, if you will. Imagine this. You're a high-functioning middle manager in Tasmania, you're earning a good wicket, you're on top of your game, life's good. You're in the role of your choice. In fact, you went to night school and got a promotion. You go out with your workmates most days, you have a coffee, stuff's good at home, everything's kicking along. And then suddenly you wake up one morning and you just really can't be bothered going to work today. In fact, if truth be known, you've had this feeling for a little while now. You've started noticing, you're yelling a little bit more, you're struggling with your concentration, you're not really sleeping well at night, but that's okay, these things will pass. But they don't pass, and eventually stuff starts to happen more and more at work. In fact, some bad news is starting to happen because the business isn't going as well as it once was, and the dreaded R word's been mentioned in your workplace. But not to worry, because you're a high performer and you're one of those indispensable people who don't have to worry about redundancies. Redundancies are what occur to other people. Life goes on and you're still coping with that nudging feeling. In fact, it's got a little bit worse than that now. You've had a performance improvement plan that's dealing with a couple of the things that you've passed off as, I dropped the ball, I just fell off my game a little bit. But the performance improvement plan doesn't say that. In fact, it starts to show a lot more. It starts to build and build. In fact, every week now, you're starting to fill in a nice little pro forma that tells you what stuff you've checked off this week and how you're going. We all know what a performance improvement plan is. It's the hangman's noose. It's building and it's building and the pressure keeps on building. And that'd be okay if stuff was okay at home. But now there's pressure at work and there's talk of trial separation on the cards. And the kids were okay, except they don't want to go to Friday night treats with mum or dad anymore, because last time you were in that takeaway shop, you blew up over no sauce available in the caddy for your pie. And that continues on and on and on, and it builds. And then suddenly we get to the point, the redundancies did come through, and surprise, surprise, you, and the other two people who on performance improvement plans all got made redundant. Imagine that. That's okay, fast forward 12 months. The first three months were probably the worst because you were unemployed. The second part of the six months was okay. You started to, you're still unemployed, but you've started to turn things around. Visitation's okay, you've moved out of home, but you're seeing your kids of a fortnightly basis now. Fast forward to the nine month mark, and you know what? Things have turned around a little bit more. You're actually starting to go back to the gym, you're meeting with your friends. Fast forward 24 months, fantastic. You've actually applied for two jobs and you've progressed to the second interview. Fast forward three years, and you've got that job, you're through your probation period, and life's good again. And you sit back and you wonder, if someone would have helped me three years ago, did I have to go through that? 
And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about some non-legal solutions to what's predominantly become a legal minefield. I get this. I know that's why you're here today. There's plenty of gremlins out there that are just waiting to get you. We're all worried about unfair dismissals. We're all worried about workers' compensation claims, anti-discrimination, work health and safety breaches. The list goes on. But let's forget about that for a minute. Because imagine if you could actually resolve this with non-legal solutions. Imagine if you could do this without having to pay expensive lawyers. Obviously not me, my fees would be reasonable. <laughs> but imagine if you didn't meet that person three years ago and, and you actually were able to resolve the solution. And the problem is we always focus on those legal solutions in this situation, but imagine if you didn't. Imagine what would be possible. So, what's the solution? Well, the solution is this, and you're going to see this slide a number of times today. I'm going to guide you through it. We're going to follow this WHS approach. We're going to assess the risks. We're going to determine facts, and then finally we're going to decide outcomes. And you know what? There isn't a courtroom in there. There's no legal solutions. We're just going to work through this practically. Imagine that very first slide. Well, take yourself back when Angela showed the physical risks versus those mental risks. And the big problem out of all of it is if that guy or girl that we were talking about with a three-year depression issue had had a sore back, do you think the same outcome would have occurred? Would they have been made redundant? Would they have had the three years of hell? Would that have happened? I think we all know the answer. I'm positive we know the answer. So, traditional approach. No doubt about it. Shut your eyes to it. Don't hear it. Whatever. Or just go and fight the fire. But the difficulty on all of that, it's all built around some legal risks which don't actually really work. So it's all built around the High Court case of Purvis. Now, Purvis is an interesting case because Purvis involved a young, a young student who had some mental health issues, used to hit the other kids. Eventually, they exclude that child from school. The parents or the guardians bring a claim and they say that child's been discriminated against on the basis of their mental health issues. And the High Court came along and they said, no, this is how you work it out. You actually ask, if you had a kid who was hitting other kids who didn't have the mental health issue, would the result have been the same? And in that situation, everyone's nodding, yeah, of course, you would exclude them from the school. And so that, that created a legal fiction amongst practitioners because everyone then started saying, you just do this comparator test. How would I treat someone if they didn't have a mental illness? If they were a poor performer, how would I treat that person? Would they be on a performance improvement plan? Well, ask yourself this, if they just had a sore back, would they be on that performance improvement plan? I don't think so. Physical versus the mental risk. And so the challenge has always been it also created that legal fiction that everyone was worried about the discrimination claim, but I've got some bad news for you. Purvis doesn't help you in an unfair dismissal case, doesn't help you in a workers' compensation case, um, doesn't help you in a privacy case, and it certainly won't give you the economic benefits that the research showed you of actually fixing the problem. So, we can look backwards, and those legal solutions are generally focused backwards, but we can definitely look forwards and solve things with legal solutions but they're done in a different way. They're very much non-legal. So let's have a look at that first approach. We're going to go through these three slides over and over today because I reckon it's this simple. Safety first. Angela and Stephen took you through all of the risk factors. We had the overwork, the unsupportive work environment, the constant intrusion of your work-life balance. And then we had those protective factors, organisations that have actually got those 
KPIs for, this, for their management. They actually understand it. They've got good policies, they've got social um, cohesion, and they've got support mechanisms. So when you're looking at it, just ask yourself first, if this person just had the bad back, what would be the risks of them remaining in the workplace? And why the hell have we immediately gone to the person has depression, how do we get them out of this workplace? Because let's face it, that's often the reality. The next thing we need to do is determine the facts. Now people are going, well that's fairly obvious, thanks Captain Obvious for telling us that, but as a lawyer when I see many of the cases that come through, the facts just aren't worked out in advance. In fact, there's a complete absence of anyone looking at the facts because if you'd actually assessed those risks, if you'd have actually taken into account the literature, you'd be saying that depression doesn't really need, or anxiety or whatever else, it doesn't need a solution that involved termination. So, first things you start needing to do, let's talk about the evidence about the capacity. And you'll need to work out what are the actual inherent requirements of your job? What do I need to do to be able to perform that? If someone has a bad back, a physical injury, or maybe even a broken leg, you're suddenly not talking about, well, they probably won't be able to come into the office anymore. But let's think about someone with a mental health issue, and let's talk about the risk factors and the protective factors. Yeah, it might mean they roll up a little bit late to work on some days. It might mean they're a little bit grumpy. It might mean they need some time off, but we're so much better equipped these days to deal with flexible work environments, and we've been dealing with physical injuries and the reasonable steps that are meant to deal with them for yonks, and we're doing it pretty well. Seeking medical advice. You don't need it, but it certainly helps if you can back up what you're thinking about with some medical evidence, okay? And we see lots of people panic all the time about, oh, got this sick certificate, don't know what to do, expert versus expert, what does this mean? Well, again, here's some, I'm gonna distill all the law around medical certificates and what you can ask for really, really quickly. Absolutely, you get a medical certificate which is a bit dodgy, Provided you've got the reasonable grounds, you can challenge on it. So when you have the guy who says, can I have annual leave? And you say no, and then he, he needs that annual leave to go to a football match, and then suddenly puts in sick leave for that same time, that would be reasonable grounds. But just because someone's put in sick leave, it doesn't mean that immediately you need to investigate any further. Be careful about relying on experts. We used to, in the legal game, and I put my hand up, I was guilty of it myself, whenever you got an expert, I got a better expert. And I said, my expert trumps you. But the biggest problem in all of that, courts have got better at it. They're now saying, I actually need to know what your treating medical practitioner says. Because if I'm working out how do you go with your work, who better than the family GP who has been with you for the journey? They'll understand how your kids are, your interaction at home and all of that. But some expert with, um, who's seen you once and writes a very expensive report probably isn't as well placed as your treating medical practitioner to know what's going on. And again, it's the subtlety, isn't it? Are you trying to get this person back to work or are you really just trying to slam them with something to get them out of the workplace? Work proactively with medical practitioners. I get it, initially it's gloves off. But medical practitioners are suspicious because there's too many of us out there in organisations who have gone to get a worker with a mental health issue. So naturally GPs are saying, hang on, I'm not giving you a lot of information. But if you actually work proactively and talk about how do we get you back to work and back on top of your game, 
you will see, and my, my experience has been that medical practitioners will work with you, but you've got to take the first step. You can absolutely question people returning to work by saying, are you fit? But again, it's got to be reasonable. So if someone's away for a week, they might have the flu. Why would you need to say, I'll need you to get a clearance? But if they've been away for three months and then suddenly got better, that will give you your reasonable grounds. You can direct a fit for work assessment. Again, think proactively, collaboratively and positively about that. Are you on the left-hand side of Stephen's um, really excellent slide about the preventative? Are you really trying to do a fitness for work assessment so I can make sure you come back, you're okay, your work is okay, and you're going to get in a better situation to actually resolve this problem? Or are you just on that far right-hand side and saying, how do I prove you can't come back? Okay? So think about how you're using your fitness for work assessments. We've got to get people on board, okay? The biggest problem is we've created fear, so employees don't want to tell you what's going on. That person right at the start in my story didn't want to say. I reckon after three years, I reckon they wish they would have said something, but they may not have felt, in fact, I'd pretty much guarantee they didn't think they could tell anyone. But we've got to give people a reason so, fair's fair, when we're asking for questions and what can we do, they need to come to the party as well, but you've got to create a, an environment where people feel safe to do that, or otherwise it just isn't worth it. Conclusions. It's about this. Is this just some sort of temporary incapacity, or is it permanent? Now, if it's permanent, let's deal with the situation. But in the majority of occasions, we've got someone saying, stress at home, um, stress at work, if these factors are adjusted, we can sort it out. It's so rare that we would see immediately a doctor's report going, this person can never, ever return to this workplace. Yet the unfortunate reality is, we've been in those workplaces where immediately when someone presents with depression, anxiety, or any other mental health issues, we're immediately going to, oh, they're gone. It'll never come back. It'll never be the same. And so we're, all of our focus, unfortunately, is on the permanent incapacity and arriving at that conclusion. And what it takes away from you, ladies and gentlemen, is the actual ability to think about practical solutions on what generally is a temporary problem, generally it can be resolved. So then we get to our end point. We're deciding outcomes now. And this is going to be your response options. Too many people immediately go to the end. And it's always a high intensity response option. It's not, hey, can we have a chat? It's, hey, you need to come to us and show cause why your employment should not be terminated. So immediately in terms of responses, we go to the 10 out of 10 response instead of the proactive, what I call one or two out of 10 response. Hey, can I have a bit of a chat? I'm a bit worried, I've got some concerns. You seem to have dropped the ball. Is everything okay? And look, certainly many of you have worked with, with um, our firm. We're absolutely on these two and we live and breathe by it. It's the only things we talk about. Is it results with respect or removal with respect? Okay? And it doesn't start one or the other. It's a transition. And if you're fair income, you go with results with respect and that's what you try. If it doesn't work, yes, you can eventually resolve the situation, but it also, the constant is the respect. And, and both Angela and Stephen brought up that reputational issue. Because it doesn't matter, ultimately, if we get to the point and, and the parties agree this just can't work or it's not good for my health that I stay in, but that's a hell of a ride and distinct from when I've just booted you out the door and both removed you without the respect, okay? So it's a positive way, and the best bit about removal with respect, it does do that cover your backside. It is actually legally better 
to go along that process instead of the attempt from most people, which is let's just get there as quickly as we can and let's get that um, problem removed. Reasonable adjustments. This is all about your workers' comp issue, but it's about resolving the problem. What is going to be reasonable will depend on the circumstances. So you're going to have to take into account all of the things that are happening with that individual, but things that are happening with your organisation as well. And so courts are now moving with this. What used to be reasonable is no longer reasonable. I said to a group the other day, it's 2017, not 1985 anymore. And, and the difficulty with that is if someone has a mental health issue, we can't just say, you're crazy, all of the thoughts in your head don't make sense. The courts are saying, yes, there may be no objective basis for them feeling they're being bullied or persecuted, but at least take it into account in your decision making. They honestly and reasonably believe that things are happening, so your decision making has to take that into account. You just can't be dismissive of it and say, hey, you're crazy, enough's enough. Finally, we'll get to that removal with respect or results with respect. And I mean that really positively. You want to be able to demonstrate you've tried first to get those results. A decision to terminate is backward looking, right? A decision for a negotiated outcome, whether that be positive or negative, is positive looking, it's good for the organisation and it's forward thinking. Finally, we get on to our reasons. It's all about wh &S, ladies and gentlemen. It's all about these used to be nice to haves. Now you know what section 46 and 47 tells you. It's $20,000 fine individually if you fail to consult with your workers. It's a $100,000 fine for your organisation. And we're seeing already a number of the cases just starting to come through. So when we're going through the mental health issues or when we're resolving one of these performance issues, just think of your three Cs. The consultation means forward information out and listening to what comes back. Coordination and cooperation, how do we work all this through? And then finally, um, I won't go through all of these because we're running a bit short on time, but you do have a list and you'll be able to take these away in the slide. And these, these can use, be used as a, uh, an addition to what Angela and Stephen have provided. But the real issue on all of this is have a plan. Work out in advance when something is happening and when you're presented with a mental health issue, go forward and ask, how do we actually resolve this with a proper plan on that three-step process? Because if you don't, you're going to end up in that legal quagmire. You're going to end up where your risk profile disproportionately increases, because I see the other end of it. And then finally, look, get your policies and procedures in order, but it's not the be all and end all. In fact, the cases always focus on, we see good organisations with good structures in place who predominantly ignore their structures. Okay, so you've got to live and breathe your policies. You've got to train people on what stuff is correct as well as what isn't. So bullying's a great one because I reckon we spend more time on telling people what bullying is and we get it wrong and we tell people that if they feel they've got a bad performance review, it's bullying and we don't focus on what it isn't. We don't focus on the reasonable management action and so it's no wonder when you have a look at the results from Fair Work, there's a bucket load of claims, but the actual results, the orders are so small, it's almost negligible. And that's because people were making claims who shouldn't have been making claims. And whose fault's that? It's the workplaces, because you were telling people they were having complaints when they probably should have just resolved it as some type of conflict. And the other big problem, ladies and gentlemen, is your organisation probably just isn't geared up to deal with that low-level conflict. Because you'd be amazed at the cases I see 
where a coffee cup left on someone's desk results in two people leaving an organisation, a massive workers' compensation claim, and someone else leaving under a separation uh, uh, certificate. Okay? So think about that. Think about how you can actually resolve these issues practically. Okay. Um, that'll guide you through. The question for you today is, are you really fair dinkum about results with respect or removal with respect? Because if you are, you've got so much information which you can use all of that and it doesn't cost you anything and you don't even need to see a lawyer, but you've just seen one. Thank you.